neighbor narc tien wadrang actinuk makperi and wadrang bagaruk manameth mir bea nilinga wadrang bake karingarapu bunjo the ego wa the crow kimbani ba dian gilson welcome to wadrang country live from wadrang country welcome to lance tv Coming to you from the palatial new Camp Street Studios in Ballarat, get ready to laugh, think, love and sparkle. And now, it's time to turn that camp dial all the way up to fabulous. Here's your host, the multi-award winning Lance-tastic, Lance DePoil. Kia ora to all my Māori friends who are watching from wherever you are. Um, I have loved what's happened in New Zealand Parliament, that's all I'm saying. But for everybody else, if you don't know what's going on, I'm Lance De Boyle and you're watching Let's TV, coming to you live, 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 live from Wadarung Country, here in Ballarat, the resting place of Bunjul the Eagle. Please, top up your sofa and get yourself comfortable on your nearest drink. Come and sit down. Come and sit down. Darlings, how wonderful to see you all. Hope you've all been well. Uh, spring definitely has done a bit of the old sprung. Um, here in Ballarat, it's going to be about 31 degrees tomorrow. So sun's out, guns out, kids. Um, it's going to drop away for a few days, but summer is, summer is coming, John Winter. What's his, what was his name from? John Winter? John Snow. John Snow, that's right. It was... <laughs> Anyway, welcome to Lance TV. We are a live show. And I'm just talking to our floor manager going, what was, what was the context I was reaching for? Talking about context uh, reaching for, I would like to um, let everybody know, if you don't already know, our transgender friends have been celebrating Transgender um, Month. Uh, this week in particular has been Transgender um, Awareness Week. So mm, to all my wonderful trans and gender diverse friends. And um, Wednesday is Transgender Day of Remembrance and it's a point in time for us to remember all of our wonderful trans family who have crossed over the Rainbow Bridge. Here in Ballarat and next week, though, we will be celebrating... If you can bring the slide up, please, Soph. Um, there will be a smoking ceremony here in Ballarat uh, at 7 o'clock at Barclays Square. Um, and it is, um, while it's a smoking ceremony, it is, um, it is a, an event that is, includes all of our communities, so who are touched by the lives of our trans family. Thank you, Dr Sophie. So, yeah, just wanted to put that up. We got that um, after we'd actually put together the um, All About the Shop, uh, so we wanted to give that a shout out. Talking about shout outs, we're going to do a call in and we're about to call in our very special guest tonight, all the way from Wadarung country at the other end, <laughs> um, is our wonderful guest tonight, the artist known as Foot. Darling. Hello. Oh, darling. Mwah. 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 You look fabulous. Who oh, are you wearing? You. Me. Oh, my gosh. Is this what you create? Mm. Oh, my gosh. We'll get into it. We'll get into it. Yeah, yeah. Oh, how wonderful. Um, you are an amazing human being. Thank you. This Thank isn't you. the first time you've been on the show, is it? No. I am a, a staple at this point. A <laughs> staple? Yeah. As in kind of paper and, and pen staple? Yeah, we'll go with it. We'll twice, we'll makes a, twice makes a sense. We'll go with that. That is hilarious. Um, thank you for coming back on the show. And I honestly, you have been the best dressed uh, guest that we have had all year. Oh, thank you. Yeah, so saving, saving the best to last. I've been singing at you a bit tonight, haven't I? Yeah, I know. <laughs> I'm going to go home in the car just karaoke. Yeah, fantastic. Um, to Nan, Pauline and to Ben and Biscuit, from us to you, we know that you're out there watching. Um, now, for people who are unsure on who you are, Foot, mm -hmm. would you like to just give us a little taste of what it is you do? 
Uh, I am a queer, multidisciplinary gremlin, I like to say. Sort of put my hat in a many buckets and hope that it turns sour. Um, and it often does. Fantastic. So you can't let yourself down that way. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> Love it. Now, for, for the top end of the show, we have a pre-recorded mm -hmm. segment, which is called Lance TV's Artist Corner. Tonight, our special guest is the Melbourne Games Festival. Uh, Dr. Safe takes us down to Melbourne for that. Uh, we're going to say hi to all of those people. And when we come back, we're going to have a big chat with Foot right after this. I'm Luke Miller, uh, Creative Director of the Melbourne Queer Games Festival, uh, which is an annual event where a group of volunteers, we, we just get people from around the world to send in their games and we try to put a bit of spotlight on them and, and show them off and, and try and get people interested in this really amazing, uh, you know, collection of art, really, this subgenre of video games. You know, we really, we're the rainbow alphabet and we really do try to provide something for everyone. You know, there's women who love women games and there's a lot of trans games and there are a lot of um, gay games. You know, I grew up and there just weren't any gay characters in any video games. It just, you know, it wasn't allowed, it wasn't talked about, it wasn't thought of. You know, famously companies, the few times it was attempted, the company would delete it. I think in Nintendo, I guess their attitude is, oh, it's not about being, you know, anti-queer or anti-gay. We just don't want to sexualize our characters or have these complicated topics in it. But then I think of like the first Mario games or whatever, it's literally, you know, he's killing everything in his way to get to the princess at the end of the level, you know, and that's about as straight as it gets. As an adult, I was just looking back at that period going, oh, there's a real empty shelf, you know, where these games should be, where you can just play as a gay man or see yourself reflected in the games you love. And so I made a few games and something I noticed that when you went to Google and typed in, you know, gayest games, like get, give me a list of the gayest games, it would autocorrect to worst games um, because at the time, uh, you know, gayest was an insult. It's like, oh, what you've made this, you know, that's such a dumb gay game kind of thing. And so Google had been trained to associate it with worst. Uh, 74 games are in this year's showcase. And there really is something for, for everybody. From around the end of September, uh, we have the shortlist, which is the games that we really think kind of really exemplify sort of a snapshot of this year's games. You know, it's not really about ranking. It's just really about sort of creating more space to talk about these games and kind of putting them next to each other to kind of illuminate them. And then on the 7th, we do hand out a few medals. But once again, the medals are more about sort of saying, just take a look at these games and, and just giving the developers a chance to sort of talk about it a bit more. Because, you know, as you know, queer folk and as queer artists, you really have to create the space to talk about your, your art a bit. And so um, that's, you know, it's just a really great way for people to get a few more blog posts, really, out of their games. When you talk about the Queer Games Festival to the media, you really have to, I feel, obliged to sort of focus on it's accessible and there's something for everyone. But I would love to talk more about sort of the nuances of the different kind of games we get. The, the, the type of game is not so important to me as much as like the content or the vibe, I guess. The ones that speak to me can come out of left field a bit. Like I really enjoyed this year um, Cow Life Sim RPG, which it looks uh, sort of like a bit childish, like it's sort of painted in, done in paint, uh, you know, and you're just this little cow sort of moving around, but it's actually sort of got this sort of queer sensibility that I think really shines through. Like you can really only do two things, like pick up items and set things on fire. I sometimes think with the with the furry visual novels that there is, it's almost like a sort of a, a happy version of a sort of a monsterism, because we get a lot of monster games in the festival about vampires, about, you know, dark elves and, and that sort of stuff. We do get a lot of, um, I guess, sort of hero versus villain stories in queer games. And I think that's one of the, the things where you can point to um, you know, being lesbian or being gay as like a as a benefit to storytelling and that y your heroes and your villains can kind of be a lot more equal in a way. You know, the text games are always underrated, I think, just not even just at the festival, just on itch and just in general, because I think people see a slab of words and they don't want to know about it. But, you know, the poets are writing those games. In Colardus uh, is another one. It's actually a yeah, yeah, it's like a first-person shooter, but, um, you know, I guess with a bit of a feminine gaze kind of thing. And 
we really want to share these games and get people to look at them. And um, if you're not a gamer, it's a really great way to get into games because they're short games, they're five minute games, they're very personal and autobiographical, and you can play them off in the browser for free. Um, but if you're a, a mainstream gamer, especially if you're a queer person, uh, you'll find a connection uh, and you'll find storytelling and you'll find sort of gameplay elements that you've never encountered before that will delight you. You know, I'm not paid to say that. I'm genuinely here because I love queer games and really want people to know about them. Unlike films, unlike paintings, you know, which, and, you know, novels, which all require like physical components, video games just entirely come out of the human mind. And it just doesn't get queerer than that. Gaming. Hi, Facebook. How are you? If you're watching us right now and you would like to send a message to Foot while we're doing the interview, you can find us on Lance TV Ballarat and you'll find the live feed there if you're looking for us. Um, are you a gamer? I am. Yes, I am. Oh. Yeah. What sort of games do you play? Um, I'm kind of a little bit of everything. I love a good cosy game. I love a game where I'm like a farming or a fishing situation, like something I would never do in real life. That's what I enjoy. Just like some monotonous task. Love. Really? Yeah. Were you a Tam did you were you around for Tamagotchi? Tamagotchi. I I ever have met Every time I got you I've ever been gifted has died within the first five minutes of me having it. Right, so. that's what I was going to go with the measure. It's kind of like, so if you do meaningless <laughs> things, you've, so Tamagotchi's yep. not it, but yep. farming and... Just any of that kind of stuff, yeah. Sims? Oh, I love Sims, yeah. Oh, love a Sim. Tell me about um, Sims. I don't, see, I don't game, so I don't know. I love Sims mainly because I'm a hideous person. I love creating a family <laughs> and then destroying them in some <laughs> I am heinous God. way, yeah. <laughs> I have a Sims that I started probably six, seven years ago and continued. And the amount of inbreeding in that game is troublesome. Is it the Banjo family yeah. sitting, all sitting on the screen? They swings? eventually, yeah. Uh, you know, at a certain point, you know, the tree becomes a circle. Oh. So, mm. yeah. You were saying um, your partner, Ben, games? Yeah, big gamer. Yeah, loves Nintendo, loves a lot of... Really, he's the one that I always give the controller to if the fight is too difficult. He's um. very good at what he does, and that suits me, somebody who's not very good at what they do in the gaming department. Right, so multi-platform players or...? Yeah, yeah, sometimes, yeah. A little PC, a little Xbox, a little Switch. I love busting out my old DS and playing a lot of little games. When I went overseas, I played like My Sims Kingdom, which was this like terrible, quaint game from like 2006. And I was like on the plane while everybody's watching like Harry Potter movies being like... Nice. Yeah. Nice. It was really lovely, yeah. And what's a DS? <laughs> Are they the little... It's like, yeah, it's just like... Welcome back. You're watching Let's TV. I am Lance DeBoyle and I'm here with the very, very lovely... Artist known as Foot. That's me. That's you. Now, darling, do I have to always say the artist known as Foot or can I just call you Foot? Foot is fine. Fantastic. I meant to ask. I was, you know, because that's how I've introduced you as Foot. But, yeah. All right. Thank you. Now, darling, we are at the point of the show where we're going to start an interview. Are you all right with that? <gasps> no. Yes. Are you sure? Yeah. We have consent, everybody. Consent, Important. consent. Um, now, this isn't your first time on the show. No. You were on the show two or three years back. Mm -hmm. um, and that was around about the time that you had a dream about foot. Yeah. So I sort of... Uh, coming into identity and strange personas. Yeah, I had a very silly dream. I was waiting on the wings of a theatre, I believe, and the person who uh, was there, I had no idea why I was there. The person just announced me and said, oh, next to the stage, foot. And then I just walked on. And I didn't do anything. I just stood there to rumptious, thunderous applause. And I thought, this is fantastic when I woke up. And so I made a very silly TikTok about it. And it took off, like, two million views. Everybody was like, 
please do it. This is the best name I've ever heard. And then they sort of just stuck. And I've done a lot of like internal monologues about what it might mean, but maybe I'm just an enigma in the end. Oh, an enigma wrapped in a riddle, mm -hmm. wrapped in a... A oh, foot. A foot. There you go. Um, you were saying, I mean, you mentioned um, TikTok, was it? Yeah. That social media, you have actually built your profile mm. um, on the social medias. I think as disgusting as social media can be, um, it can be a powerful tool, especially for artists and creators. Um, and I think that sometimes you can work it in your favour. Um, and I, at times, am a big advocate for any traction is traction. It necessarily doesn't have to be good, but any traction that you get can give you some momentum. And I think that's what that TikTok did. And then I just kind of took off from there and I explored and I shared my process a bit more and took people through what it's like to actually make an artwork because it demystifies. I think when people see behind the curtain of a, a process, they get really intrigued and they get really interested. Amazing. And the different socials really have there's a different way of working them as well. Mm. Like, do you have all the socials or do you have the the, uh, the, the, the key ones or do you have, yeah, like, even I more kind used of... used to have all of them. I'm going to be really honest. I was, like, really, like, I'll just have everything. And then through down the line, it's just been drop off as they go. And I think Instagram and TikTok are where creatives thrive, I think, the most. Um, and I think I just keep those around. Um, and that's it. It's pretty much all I use now, so. Amazing. Go, yeah. And like the difference between TikTok and Insta as somebody who is creating content, mm. what, what is that? What, what's the difference between the two? It's, uh, it evolves uh, day to day, I think. Um, TikTok for a while, we're really into seeing behind the curtain, like I had just seen the process but really in short doses. And I think now TikTok is more about big discussions, long videos, talking, creating dialogue, creating, you know, conversation. Um, and Instagram has turned into the wanting to show the process um, and, you know, more of engagement of like the artists themselves rather than what we're trying to say on TikTok. Yeah, right. Yeah, because, I mean, I look at TikTok, I'm, I'm very, very green with TikTok. I, I see it, I look at it, I see people who, like the RuPaul girls, mm, mm. You know, like when you go back through their, their TikTok stories. Yeah. Like you sort of peg the time when they kind of hit the mark and it's all fresh and new. Yeah. And then as time goes on, you can sort of see the numbers dwindling away because it's like, the next episode or the next series of RuPaul's come out and it's like, oh, okay. And then that person's working three times harder to try and get what they originally had. Yeah, I'd say so. Also, it's about like just continuously posting because you will never know what is picked up. Like I sometimes a video that, you know, somebody makes six months ago, somehow Mr. Our, Mr. or Mrs. or they algorithm takes it and Suddenly runs with fine. it. Yeah. Sudden fire. That one, for some reason, yeah. Wow. And, yeah, because it is understanding how the algorithms work. I don't think anyone can understand. Well, somebody, somebody must because yeah. somebody's making Some, them. Yeah, no. down the line, yeah. <laughs> Hilarious. I mean, I don't. <laughs> no. So you've gone from having 400 socials that you were looking after. So Facebook, which, yeah. is, which is an older kind of group. Do you think Facebook's a bit of a dinosaur these days? I mean, yeah, I'm, I don't want to say yeah, but it, yes. it is. It, but yes, yeah. yes it is. Um, it is to an extent, but I also think um, Facebook is the one where you can, it's probably the one where it's easily, most easily accessible for everybody. Because, um, you know, Instagram and TikTok, it can be pretty full on. Like it's a lot of stuff just immediately, whereas Facebook you, you know, it's you just sort of one moderated post. Yeah, moderated a little bit more. Yeah. Amazing. Um, what, are, what other ones did you have along the way? 
uh, Twitter, back when it was Twitter. Oh, yeah. run, run, yeah. leave her. Yeah. She's too slow. Yeah. Uh, oh, I had a Tumblr back in the day. That's a... Mm, um, I can't remember all of them. Just honestly, I used to just jump on one to see whether or not there'd be community there and then I sort of move on when I there was nothing that stuck or that I couldn't find people but and then you know you sort of build people outside of social media who feed into the social media so you actually create physical community and then within that you gain social media anyway mm. so the long story is short because we normally start with saying where where were you born oh yeah but um you know we we now understand that that foot was born about three or four years ago yeah I don't think they have a place that they were born. Um, maybe in the... In the ether. Yeah, that's what I was about to say. In, oh. in the ether, yeah. But, yeah. Um, yeah. I was born in Launceston, the physical being. Yeah? Yeah. yeah. Wow. Good old Tazzy. Fantastic. Well, Lon is a really nice place. Mm, it really is, yeah. I'd mm. love to go back soon, actually. Nice red dirt, all that stuff. Mm. That red, rich... The gorge. Oh, dear. The gorgeous gorge. Mm, mm. Amazing. Well, we're going to go for a short break right Perfect. now. And when we come back, we're going to have some more of the lovely foot right after this. <coughs> uh, Randy Sturgis in capital, bold capital letters, yelling at us, a style icon. I like to think so. Do you know Randy Sturgis? I do know Rani. Right down there. Hey, Rani. Um, love you. Love your work. Um, Rani, we'll get into it later, but Rani also modelled for me for oh. a certain event that we will talk about soon. Amazing. Mm. Well, what do you want to shoot the breeze on now? We're just on Facey. Talk about anything. Talk about um, what's... Everybody go watch Junior Eurovision. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, let's talk about Biscuit for a couple of minutes. Oh, yes. Yes, please. Now, I can talk about let's talk. Who is, or who mm -hmm. is Biscuit? Biscuit is my beautiful baby uh, Dash Hound. He Sausage is dog. one year, and, almost one and a half. So, you know, still a, still a little baby. Um, he is a beautiful, loud, obnoxious weenie, and I love him. I don't know. I just... I was never a dog person. When I first met my husband, I was a cat person and he was a dog person. And I think we've just slowly weaved each other into like, yeah, animal people. You like, morphed into, yeah. into beast people. Yeah. Um, but Biscuit is a beautiful baby and I don't know. I is just, Biscuit brown? Uh, he's, yeah, like black and tan. Mm. Black and tan, beautiful. It's a bit unusual. Yeah. Um, and he... Was supposed to be miniature, but he is not miniature. He's um, like in between miniature and a normal dash hound, so he's like, you know, mid size. But how, what, how long is a normal? It's like 40, 40 mm, centi 50 yeah, centimeters. Yeah, about this big, I reckon. And how big's biscuit? Probably about that. Yeah. So about. Yeah. So he's how big's a miniature? Like. Oh, really small. I think his mum. It was a miniature, and his dad was not, and somewhere in there, yeah, mm. came through. But he's, um, yeah, loud, rambunctious. Love him. I don't know. It's a weird thing when you life before a dog, life after a dog. It's very different, and I don't think I can imagine myself. No, dogs are dogging. great. I really, I, like, I'm a dog person. I was brought up with cats. <laughs> Welcome back. You're watching Let's TV. I'm Lance De Boyle, and I'm sitting here with Foot. Foot. Um, now, darling, you were telling me that you originally did your artistic creative education mm -hmm. at Warrnambool TAFE. Hello, everybody in Warrnambool. Southwest, yes. Represent. Mm -hmm. um, you went through there, but you were a photographer. Yeah, yeah, I came out of that um, a photographer. I was really into portraiture. I loved portraits. I still do. You can sort of see that evolve a little, but I was always on the other side of the camera. I loved taking photos of people. Yeah. Amazing. You were also a bit of a writer. I was. That 
sort of before I went into my visual arts as a writer, and then after I started my photography, I sort of combined the two a little, but I was a, kind of unsure of where to go, and I was really unsteady in what I wanted to create for a little bit, but, you know, I think everybody, especially if, as a creative, you need to sort of stumble around in the dark for a little, I feel. Well, you... as a photographer, maybe stumble around a little bit in the dark yeah. room. Yeah, exactly, um, yeah. Um, what sort of camera were you using or have you got? Uh, I was a, just a really bad, cheap DSLR for quite a few years, like just a little Sony situation. Um, but I really loved film photography. I did do some darkroom stuff. Um, and then slowly over the course, which I still claim to this day, I became known as the Polaroid princess. Stunning. Because I just started collecting Polaroids. And I think part of that, it's like I have a very low attention span at times and Polaroids are an immediate gratification and it's quite instant and it's a process where you can't really fiddle with the end result. You just kind of get what you get and that's the magic of the process and I love that. I all love, about it. Yeah, all, all about, about it. it, yeah. So from that, you've gone from portraiture and mm -hmm. writing to working in textiles but you mm. got there by way of COVID, didn't you? I did, yeah. So during COVID, like many artists, our work sort of dried up or even our um, intention to work, we sort of just were like, you know, maybe we, you know, we, we went in on ourselves and we decided to either reinvent or redecide or reevaluate. And I reevaluated in the way of protest. I got really angry because during COVID, I was also exploring identity and I got frustrated that I couldn't explore my identity in a way that I saw other people do that through textile and clothing. Because I think one of the ways that we kind of discover who we are as queer individuals is through, you know, how we present to the world and that happens first with clothing. And so I couldn't do that as a plus size person because we have very limited options. So it's like, well... It's time to start making my own stuff, I think. So that's what I did. I basically just taught myself to sew. Amazing. So <clears throat> no sewing background at all in the back Me at all? Very little. Like my nan, shout out again, taught me how to, you know, sew a button onto something. But that was like the extent of my knowledge. Yeah. Amazing. So with those early days of creating pieces... What, like, what sort of fabrics and textiles were you using? Basically anything I could get my hands on. There was a period where, again, through protest, I went through my closet even and, like, found stuff that had been damaged or had rips or tears or whatever and had just been sitting in the closet forever. Um, and I just rejigged them. There's, like, one of my first pieces was a jumpsuit that was just created out of probably six or seven pieces in my cupboard that... I pieced together for very specific reasons. We won't go into it here, but they were all really specific pieces that I, yeah, morphed together. And I think that has kind of followed through. I always used to like use materials that are found or anything. I'm not a big, you know, I don't like, I like to use sustainable materials. And and what you're wearing tonight is, is a bit of a reflection of that. Yeah, I think so. It's a big, um, I like to say that I do a bit of collage with fabric, I think. It's a lot of pieces on pieces on pieces on pieces. I'm not a, you know, Chanel take one thing off kind of gal. <laughs> Put one thing but back yeah, on. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, that's it. Yeah. You know, look in the mirror, take one thing off and then you're no. good. Yeah. It's like put one thing back, back on yeah. and then another thing back yeah, on. that's it. Until you can't sort of like do any more and then mm. you're done. That's it. There's no such thing as overworking a piece. No, never. <laughs> Just thought I'd throw it out there. Yeah. Just want to know. Um, so you d you've been doing that for the, the last three or four years. Mm. You've been kind of exploring how um, textiles sit together and in, a, in a kind of sewing situation. Mm. And about nine months ago, people, people were starting to really give you a lot of feedback, weren't they? Yeah, I think so. I think like the nature of through COVID, I spent all, you know, the last three years really exploring who I was and who Foot was and who we were through textile and various ways of presenting myself through textile and crazy outfits. Um, and yeah, nine months ago, I just something sort of clicked. It was actually one specific work that I got some feedback on where, for a lack of a better way of phrasing it, I 
had been told when I was very young, and I don't know if anyone else or you're familiar with this adage of the, um, the scare tactic to try and get people to lose weight when you're young is that you'll get so fat you'll fuse to your couch. It's a very, it's a common adage. And I had thought about that and that had sort of sat with me and it had been in my journal for ages. And so what I ended up doing was I ended up turning myself into a couch that had been left on the side of the road. I like created this big textile outfit with like crazy funky plush arms and I went and sat on the side of the road and took this portrait. And the feedback that I got specifically from that changed the perspective of how I looked at, this wasn't just my narrative, it was like the narrative of so many other people that I knew that had really similar experience. And I think through that, I just realized that, you know, it was, though I knew what I was doing was important, I didn't realize how important it was. Because you, you, you part of your... Um self-description in, in the bio there, mm. you were saying that, that you are actually um, um, a plus-size advocate. Yeah, I like to think, yeah, I'm pro-fat folk at every level. Every level. Exactly, <laughs> yeah. Well, yep. How does that manifest, though, for you? Um, I think it comes in terms of making sure that both my practice and the messages that I put out are really exploring and delving into the perspective of somebody who grew up fat. I've never been thin and the experience of how that changes both the way that you um, mature and how even as a queer person, you flower into that queerness. It's a different lens when you're a fat person because again, there's like diff we have different access to resource. There's you know, I've had... Well, society, <coughs> society has a nasty way of framing mm -hmm, plus-size people. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I've actually recently, I, I had a little bit of a discussion online about there's a way that as a plus-size person or a fat person, because we should not be afraid of the word fat, you know, it's, it's just a descriptor, um, that we, uh, everything we do is put under a lens. Like, if, if I go out and I... I'm having a, you know, a bad day and I want to get myself a burger. I'm going to go and get myself a burger. That's a regular person thing. That happens to everybody. Everybody goes and does that. But that's not what the narrative is if I go out and do that. The narrative is I've made a terrible body choice. I'm a terrible person. That's going to haunt me for the rest of my life. And that's a, that's a really heavy, for a lack of a better phrase, it's a heavy weight to carry constantly that perspective and that you kind of, it fatigues you in a way, I think, growing up. And even now, yeah. And I think, so, yeah, a lot of my messaging is around, you know, making sure that other people know that that happens and how to change that bias to, to, to sort of rethink that when you go out. Because we all do it. Even myself, you've got to, it's called the, it, it's called fat bias. Um, there's a bunch of beautiful references I can give you, but I'm blanking. But yeah, and so it's a way of working into the anti-fat bias where you, it's everything you need to do to re-switch that out. Amazing. You're amazing. Oh, thank you. No, thank you. Uh, we need to go for a short break. Okay. When we come back, we're going to have some more of the lovely foot. See you in a minute. Looking in the Facebook thread, uh, Rani Sturges, I'm proud. I'm so, so proud of you, my love. Oh, I'm, that's so sweet. I'm proud of me too, but I'm also proud of them. Great. Uh, Johnny Wombat, hello, darling, how are you? Howdy, strangers. Johnny Wombat um, has a Fantastic show name. on Channel 31 mm -hmm. uh, called uh, Out of the Can with Wombat and Goose. Johnny is the wombat element of that. <laughs> and they have a show that shows short Australian films cool. on Channel 31. Mm. So if you are into short Australian film, you can tune in anywhere in the world on CTV Plus. Um, click on C31 or click, click on Melbourne and um, you should be able to catch up with Wombat and Goose on that show, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, Johnny, if you're still there, let me know um, what time the show's on. I think it's midnight tonight or half past 11 or something. So 
Johnny, Johnny, just pop in the thread for us. There you yeah, go. Yeah, please, I want to know too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They've been doing it for years, I think. Yeah. But they've been around nearly as long as Lands TV, I think four, four years or so on Channel 31. Fantastic. Yeah. And uh, any time we go to a Channel 31 uh, event, we, t we, we search each other out. No, it's funny. It's like, oh, you're here, so you. All right, no, no, no. And then Comrades we part ways. Yeah. yeah, it's funny. Yes. Got to touch base. Um, yeah, thank you for sharing the 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 the, the fat story. Because mm. yeah. it's because it's like we we are conditioned not to say the word fat. Yeah. Because it's um, awkward. Um, so every, everything's plus size because it's more polite, I suppose. Yeah. Um, but yeah, society and that nasty sort of like, you're like this, so you go there and you're like that. It's, it's a little bit like when a disabled person goes to the shop and does their shopping and they're suddenly they're, they're an inspiration. And it's like, well, it's so all, they're, all they're doing yeah. is going to the shop. Yeah. Oh, it's, yeah, it's really strange. And, you know, all you got to do is you just got to, it's about intention. Like if you're talking to another individual, you just need to say to them, hey, you know, are you, you know, what? descriptors to use. It's exactly the same as anything else. Yeah. Yeah, well, and that's... Liftoff. We have a liftoff. Welcome back. Channel 31. Don't mind me while I'm looking down. Um, I'm still here with the very lovely foot, and I want to talk about some more things that are very recent for you. Oh. And they've all happened this year, haven't they? Yeah, yeah. There's like this holy trinity of, yeah, this big explosion. So you are at New York. Mm -hmm. We're in a collaboration with Sophie, Sophie Chalk. So mm -hmm. you were in New York yeah. showing your fashion. Yeah, I was. Again, shout out to the beautiful Sophie Chalk. Um, she is an Australian born, currently New York residing um, artist, which is a photographer. Um, she is a beautiful process photographer. She's a tintype photographer. I don't know if... It, what does that mean? Uh, it's be beautiful, um, you know, standing box camera. Yeah. Really old school. Yeah, really beautiful setup. It's incredible. It's a beautiful process to watch. Um, and she's like a chemical genius. Um, and so I got to go over and, yeah, we worked together. Um, we had met on TikTok. So, again, it's about building community. And we sort of just slowly got into each other's, we earwormed each other into how much we loved each other's art practice. And I, um, yeah, got the chance to travel over there. I won the Hue and Cry Art Prize, shout out to Hue and Cry, a gallery in Geelong. And I used that money to fund the trip to go to New York for the, we put together a really small residency sort of ideal collaborative body of mess work. And um, yeah, we did, some photography, we shot a Super 8, we kind of just messed around. I took, I shipped some of my closet to New York. Um, and then, yeah, we just had a bit of a play and then we came back and had an exhibition at the beautiful Unassigned Gallery in Brunswick. Um, and it was, yeah, a beautiful, magical experience. So Amazing. Called Gumnut Babies, that was the exhibition. Heaven, very Australian. Yeah, yeah. well, we both fell in love, we were bonded over our love of Mae Gibbs. So. Of course. Mm. You're the gumnut babies. Yeah. Absolutely. So New York was a thing. Mm -hmm. How long were you over there for? Two weeks. Two weeks. It was real fast paced, pretty bam, 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 in and out, in and out. But um, yeah, we got everything done. We got the body of work done. It was really intense, but it was, yeah, really incredible. Um, and I've never been overseas before, so it was my first trip into the waters. Um, oh, you're from Tasmania. <laughs> That's so weird. Boo! No. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, no, I, yeah. But I never, yeah, so it was my first sort of, yeah, big out and splash. Yeah, it was fantastic. Heaven. Uh, but that's not the only overseas journey that you've, you've undertaken. Mm. We had been, we'd been speaking on... Um, on Facebook going, when are you coming back on the show? What's going on? Is this a date? Is this a date? And one of the last times I reached out, um, you were saying, oh, no, I'm off to Venice. Yeah. Talk to us about Venice. Yeah, it happened quite quickly. Um, I'm such an opportunist. Um, I think you kind of have to be as a bit so of a career While artist. it's hot, honey, lean in. Exactly. If somebody, you know, throws you a fish, whatever that bone, whatever that phrase is, <laughs> um, yeah, so I just applied for um, this mentorship slash residency situation. 
I'm applied on a whim. I really just, you know, you just, you cast your net out a bunch of times. And I am a big believer in that. I apply for every grant, every residency, whatever. And um, applied for it, shortlisted, everything was good, fantastic. And then they were said, oh, do you want to go? And I said, uh, yeah, okay, let's do it. So it was, um, the actual project itself is five days in Venice, but it's really fast paced. You have three days of essentially like amazing race experiences with a group of people you've never met. And then you have two days to make work and it, get, it got housed in this space at the uh, Palazzo Mora, which is part of the European Culture Center. Um, and it's part of the 2024 Venice Biennale. It's a program called The Venetian Bind. And it's supposed to be about how Australian artists respond to Venice as a space and the ecology and all kinds of beautiful things. So, yeah, it was really intense. Amazing. And, and while you're talking about that, I'm, it's, I'm bringing up all, the, all of those masks and everything like yeah, that you associate yeah. Venice with. Yeah, there's lots of like Venetian stuff. We went down the route of talking about the Doge. If everybody knows Venice, there's a very famous Doge's Palace. It's a beautiful building. And um, yeah, we ended up making this like short film work that um, I had created this costume in like six hours of hand sewing to create this entire costume for this Doge character. Um, and it was all about um, how nefarious the chain of commerce in Venice is. Ooh, nefarious, mm. how wicked. Yes, yes, how, um, you know, there's a big class system in Venice that, um, sort of overarches everything that happens there and it's can be quite full on when you really look into it so go and look into it mm, yeah the doge mm. which makes me think of um elon musk's um mm. bitcoin equivalent which is also called Your doge the coin, doge yeah. well now i know why yeah i wonder mm, oh. connected connected i know um but so new york venice and Fashion Week, Melbourne Fashion Week, yeah. you, you presented 10 pieces on the runway. Yeah, so I actually was preparing for that when I found out that I was going to Venice. So I sort of lost the time when I was in Venice preparing, so it was like crazy. But yeah, Melbourne Fashion Week was sort of the biggest, it was a bucket list item and it was like biggest opportunity that I could get. So I, I managed to showcase 10 piece collection uh, as part of a program called Revival Runway. Shout out to the beautiful people that run that. It's a, I believe it is a non-profit organization where they showcase people who may not have had opportunities to debut fashion before. And um, they had an event called Queer by Design featuring queer uh, designers, artists, makeup artists, models, like they basically went all queer and it was incredible. With the thing with the models too, you told me a wonderful story mm. um, just before the show tonight. They were going to provide you with some models for this project, weren't they? Yeah, they were. So that's kind of the way they work. They, they kind of poach you to make the garments and they give you the models and the makeup artists and I kicked up a big stink. You um, had a diva moment. Yes, I did diva have a diva moment. moment. I put down my foot, if you will. Oh, look out. Um, but I really made sure that um, I put my clothes on the bodies that I wanted to put my clothes on because it wasn't just, um, it wasn't just about each piece fashion. It was about the whole consensus of each piece related to each other and the bodies that I put it on were important. So I... Yeah, they really worked with me and, and I brought in my own people. I brought in 10 people, nine, 10 um, people who were plus size or like, you know, not stick thin. Fat. Uh, yeah, fat, yeah. Um, so I had, yeah, 14 to 34 roughly is the size range. And it was really important to me that that was an element that was showcased, I think. Um, and it really did create the message. Um, so something that really came out of that, um, I had done a bunch of interviews and something that I said that really stuck with me and stuck with the other people is that when we see sort of avant-garde fashion events with these thin people carrying these uh, outfits, they play with shape and they play with fashion and us as fat folk don't ever get to do that. It's about constriction and not play. And I think that I, my outfits are always about play. They're always a bit funky and a bit interesting. And so I thought I, I, I 
interjected that to be like, you know, us as fat folk, we should be able to play with our shape too. And so that's what I brought to that event. Amazing. And you're saying too, your models were, were, were a mixture of people. Like, so there was like, there were, there were people of colour. Mm, there were like, yeah. talk to us about yeah, the, the so mix of was, models. It's kind of just like natural that it was a lot of my friends and it just ended up that we had, yeah, like some trans individuals, some POC people, we had beautiful tall people, we had some short people. It was really nice to see. It was just not... A texture of people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was, yeah. I think that was really important to me too, to sort of see it was a... To create a landscape of like what I view the world, sh not necessarily should be, but what I feel is like the most beautiful, I think. Yeah. Amazing. Foot, thank you so much for being on the show tonight and sharing this new part, well, you know, considering that we, we spoke mm -hmm. about two or three years ago, this new part is really so very exciting and very wonderful and I'm glad it's happening to you because you are a very good human being. Oh, that's sweet. Oh. And for you, for being on the show, <gasps> you get, get this tiny pride little bag so you, you can pop a few bits and pieces in so there. so big? I know. <laughs> and this famed photo of me saying I was on Let's TV. I'm going to need you to sign this. <laughs> Love. There you go. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Uh, we need to go for a short break. And when we come back, we will be in the last throes of the show. See you in a mo. We hope you enjoyed our interview with the artist known as Foot. If you'd like to catch up with Foot, you can do so via Instagram at the artist known as Foot. Lance TV will be back right after this. Johnny Wombat has confirmed that um, Out of the Can is on midnight tonight and back in December on Mondays at 9.30 with new... New episodes. How wonderful. Oh, uh, Louise Ashton Barnes oh, is the in the thread. Lou. Love, love, love. Big love hearts. Marvellous interview. Watching from UK. Yes. So proud. I believe Newbury, I believe. Hey, up, love. Took me about my stairs, it did. <laughs> Down to pit, then. No, <laughs> that's about all my English. Ooh, uh, yes. Lovely Lou. She's an original, an Australian. Oh. She, she's over there now. Living it up large. Would love to go visit one day. Yeah. So, expat? Mm, no, no. Done a runner? Yeah, done a runner, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. There you go. I wonder what time it is over there. It's got to be, what's wrong way? It's got to be afternoon. Time zones are one thing I just can't get my I think head it's around. afternoon of Never. the same day. Today's Friday. I think it's mm. possibly afternoon. Louise, Louise saying rough English. Yes, visit. <laughs> there you go. We'll make it happen. I That's guess. right. Yeah. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. So, what did you think of the interview? Really good, yeah. Yeah? Yeah. Thank you. No, it's lovely. Thank you. No, I thank can't you. wait to actually take a photo of that and show you where it will go because you will laugh. Oh, good. I have a very specific place for things that I like. Oh, one person, one guest that we had on the show this year put it on their cistern in the toilet. In the what? On the cistern? Of the? Of the toilet. That's all, I'm not going to put it on the cistern, but I You were going to put it in the bathroom? I, no, I have a toilet gallery. <gasps> I call it the Galleria. <laughs> and everywhere that I, all the people that I love are in the toilet because you spend so much time there. So you're there with everyone you love. Exactly. So I have like wall to wall. It's like an actual gallery. And Fantastic. Yeah. Is there space? Uh, I'll make space. Fantastic. Yeah. I don't like you anymore. There you go, Lancy. <laughs> no, there's some room. It's, it's not like floor to ceiling quite, but... There's, and there's some room on the ceiling so I can move some stuff Heaven. Up. Yeah. That'd be hilarious yeah. just to go, hi, Lance. Oh, welcome back to Lance TV. Now it's time for All Over the Shop. Tomorrow, there's a trash and treasure market at Holly Grove in Wendaree that starts at 9 o'clock tomorrow. It's at the Wendaree Community Hub. 17th Traditional Arts Fair at the Buddha Historic House and Garden there in Castle Maine. If you like traditional arts, go there. 21st of November, Queer Fairy Tales brought to us by our very own 
M. Chandler, and that's happening at 14 Camp Street in Ballarat. 22nd of November is the Ballarat and District's Aboriginal Corporation's Christmas Night Market, and that starts at 5 o'clock on that day in Market Street. 23rd is the 2024 Geelong Revival Motoring Festival and that's happening at Ritchie Boulevard down there in Geelong. That starts at 9. Oh my God, I'm Black, brought to you by our very own Marianne Sam down there at La Mamas and the dates are November 27th to December 8th. 1st of December, Eureka Sunday Live with Emma Donovan and that man from Goanna that's happening at Eureka Stockade Memorial Park. 13th of December, Lions Gisborne is having a festival at Gardner Reserve there in Gisborne and that starts at 4.30 on Friday the 13th. Christmas Market, Saturday the 14th at Leonard's Hill, celebrating 140 years. Uh, that starts at 9 o'clock at Leonard's Hill. 16th of January, the Barwon Grange Paranormal Investigation goes for three hours. That's down there at Geelong. That seems to be something that happens every couple of months or so. 2nd of February, introduction to bush medicine. That's happening at Selby Community House in Melbourne and that starts at 10 a.m. 8th of February, Nature's Cadence by Tamsin Rasmussen. That's happening at Post Office Box Road at Smythes Creek and that starts at 1 o'clock. And for those of you who like to get your house in order, 28th of July 2061, there will be a Halley's Comet viewing party at Namaji National Park. Back to the studio. The studio, back to the studio, back to the studio. Um... Well, that was it. Do you like, will you be around in 2061 to see Halley's Comet again? Um, I hope not. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> That's it. I don't think I will be. Yeah. Something tells me I won't, unless Why I do not? one of those, um, what was that movie with Goldie Hawn and Jack Nicholson where they were, what was that movie? Devil, yeah. Yeah, death mm. becomes her. Unless I sort of start getting the yeah. Oh. yeah thank you, thank you, Cheryl. Um, yeah, unless I sort of start getting those injections or the the special little drinks. It's about to become a musical, I believe. Actually, yeah, that's right. It is too. Yeah, um, you're quite fond of musicals. In fact, a specific kind of musical. Hey, it's a musical. Yeah. It's a musical. Eurovision. You I are a Eurovision hound, don't you? I am a Eurovision tragic. They would say, yeah. If I was ever on Mastermind, that would definitely be my special subject. How long, like, how far does your knowledge of Eurovision go to? Um, I did you pick it up at ABBA a or long before way. then? So I, my first Eurovision, I believe, was two thousand and eight, um, and so I watched it. Um, shout out to my beautiful friend, who's currently just got to America, Emma Rosicki. Um, she and I grew up together, and she introduced me a little bit to Eurovision. Um, I had sort of watched the one before and then we got really into it in 2009 and since then I've watched every iteration and then I just started watching past iterations, reading articles and it's just become sort of a comfort a thing. thing. Yeah. It was 2008 and I don't know, I want to say they were from the Ukraine. The Verka Saduchka. In the silver. That's it. I had that outfit made and I have it at home. I'm I have the so headpiece. jealous. I, I will send you a photo over the weekend. I'll put. I'll I'm throw so it on. jealous. The headpiece. I've wanted to make one for years, actually. Yeah. yeah. I'll throw it on. I won't do, do the whole thing, yeah. and I'll just snap and just go here. Look what this is. What I've got in my wardrobe. I had it made especially. You're on the robbery list. You're adding to the robbery <laughs> list. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'll get that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> um. Who who have been out of you out of Eurovision mm. top five over the years? Uh, entrance or countries? Oh, there's mm. a difference there, isn't yeah. there? Yeah, let's just go countries. It's broad. Right. Um, Ukraine, you brought it up. Ukraine yep. killer. They always do really well. I think Eurovision is important to showcase who you are as a country, like on stage through music, and I think Ukraine does that really well. Um, I'm always a sucker for an uh, underdog, so I love a good San Marino, the smallest country in Eurovision. Yeah. Um, 
I love, I tend to like French entries. They are very French, and it's just so camp the, how French they are, and I love that. I love our own entries. Got to have some homegrown pride. Uh, and so, so I remember when um, oh, Dami went. Mm, that was the second year we were in. That was the second year. Who went the first? Oh, it Guy was, Sebastian. I was going to say that Sebastian person. Woo. Oh, woo woo. <laughs> so Guy Sebastian, um, Dami, Dami M. M. Mm-hmm. and then Isaiah Firebrace. Oh, that's right. Yep. Did Kate Miller? I yep, go Kate to following Mill you. Heike. Oh, it's as though I know what's happening. It's spooky. You're on it. Yeah, Kate and who was, who was Montaigne, it? and then Montaigne, because COVID got cut down, so she went the next, or they oh, went Montaigne the next year. Montaigne was First Nations. Uh, Montaigne, yeah. Uh, in, with the, the guy with the keyboard. And no, that was, no, 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 that's the most recent. That's yeah. Electric Fields. Yes, that's it. And then we had Voyager in between there somewhere, oh. and Sheldon Riley. Bam, 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 bam. Oh, yeah. we've been a few times. Mm. Yeah, that, that was all. Because I, I don't know, for some reason I've just gone, nah, I've just, because I was watching it for a few years to go, it's the be all and end all. Yeah. Oh, I know what happened. We started doing Lens TV on Saturday nights in 2017. Yeah, that's there what you it go. Was. Yeah. And it was, yeah, so I haven't, be, I haven't watched for years. But you were saying that there is a junior. There is a junior Eurovision, yeah, which is tomorrow night. Tomorrow night. SBS. I believe, everybody, <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. Tomorrow night, uh, or I believe you can stream it somewhere else. I can't remember, but um, Junior Urban is really lovely. Less countries, but you just—I'm always floored by how talented children are. It's ridiculous. That you know, seven-year-olds, eight-year-olds just belting it out. Oh, I couldn't do anything at seven years. I was eating dirt. No, <laughs> yeah. I'm still eating dirt, yeah. darling. I'm still at my yeah, anyway. Um, Amazing. So how long has Junior Eurovision been going on for? Oh, a couple of years ago, oh, testing my waters, was 20, this would be like the 22nd iteration, I think. I'll tell you, this is the first time I've ever heard that there was ever a Junior Eurovision. Mm, It's good. It's really good. Yeah. We used to be in it for a couple of years. Australia was in it for a couple of years and then, yeah. Do you think, In and out. I'm actually really curious, and let me, I'll, I would like your take on this. What, I mean, I understand how Eurovision came like together. Yeah. I understand the whole sort of radius mm-hmm. of radio frequencies. Um, what is the point of us? I knew you were going to ask. I'm, I'm glad I didn't let I'm you down. I'm a staunch advocate for Australian Eurovision. Uh, Eurovision is less about Eurovision, and it's less about Europe itself now and more about the celebration of music and diversity. Um, and so when Australia was invited, it was because we had been the country that had broadcast the contest the longest um, out, and outside of Europe. So we were, and we, we go crazy for Eurovision. We still do, oh, yeah, sure. you know, huge here. Is Germany still our host country? Wasn't Germany our host country to start with? No, no, the like a host uh, where it's hosted, it changes every year. Yeah, I get that yeah. bit. I thought German, there was something that oh, there's this big conspiracy that if Australia ever wanted to have to be hosted in Germany, but really, I don't think that's necessarily oh, is true. That what but, I'm getting, okay. but we were invited, and uh, due to we have what's called an association or associate status of the EBU, the European Broadcasting Union, and anyone who is an associate of the EBU can participate. So there's been discussions like Kosovo, like Liechtenstein, all these little countries can compete. Vatican City. Vatican City. Oh, could you imagine? Yeah, (laughs) just singing none. Get them on. Um, But, yeah, and so... Dominica, Nica, Nica, was good, St. Dominique. Anyway. Would have done really well, I think. (laughs) I mean, pre-1990 would have done well. Yeah, yeah, Yeah. not now. Yeah. Um, Um, So top three acts over the last... Kate Miller, Hyde Key. Yeah. Uh, Bambi Thug from this year. Where were they from? Ireland. Yeah. Oh. Um, really incredible. Not Jed Wood. No, not Jed Wood. <laughs> I love, the way, I love the way your face just fell. Probably Verka Saduchka. <gasps> yeah, right. Um, on that note, we will wrap it up. Thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you. Oh, no, thank you. Uh, thank you to Cheryl and Dr. Sophie being in the studio and much love to Patrick down there at Channel 31 and to everybody watching 
Thank you so much for taking the time. We will not be on next week because Dr. Soph is flying off to the United States of America and we will not have a vision switcher, so we won't be on air, but we will be back um, the week after that. Um, but during all that time, please remember, uh, especially in this time, day and time, be kind to each other. Thanks for watching Lance TV. We'll be back same time next week. Lance TV is made possible through funding from the Community Broadcasting Foundation. I'm voiceover guy Randall Smith. See you next time. <laughs>